Let me say good evening to you. It's about five minutes before we begin our New Hebron Bible study Q&A, and we begin promptly at 9.30 as normal. We'd like to come on just a little bit early. Uh-oh, making technical adjustments here. Just a little bit early to be able to greet one another, to say hello to one another, since we are in such different times now, strange times. We take these few moments just to say hello. So if you don't mind when you come on, please just type in hello and greet one another. And we have just about five minutes before we get uh, started. Uh, for those that may not know me, my name is Rodney Smith, Sr. And I pastor New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church, where God has blessed me to be now for over 13 years. And I, I will say it again, uh, God has blessed me to be with some fine people, some great people, some good people, some loving people have been kind to me and my family, and have always showed a love and devotion for God. And so tonight, as we do our Bible study question uh, and answer period, I want to always remind you, remind you, remind you to please, please, please get your Bibles. Make sure that you have your Bibles, whether it's via an electronic device, or if you just are like me and just love to have that paper Bible. Um, if you're somebody who has a Bible and the pages are coming out and the cover is worn, I heard the preacher say long, long ago, many years ago, and I never forgot this. And he said, if you have a Bible that's falling apart, it usually means you have a life that's not. That means you've been using that Bible. So let's uh, get ready tonight. We have a couple of announcements to give to you. Uh, Sister Gardner, good evening. Uh, Sister Abram. One half of the A-team, good evening to you, to my cousin Tanya. Brother Tidwell, good evening, sir. God show been taking good care of you. You know what I'm talking about. He done, he done blessed you. We don't have to worry about that, those long trips to Atlanta in that white van, you know, staying overnight, driving nine, ten hours. You got something a little bit better right now. So, man, I sure appreciate you, old Tidwell. We go way back there. And so I hope everyone is doing fine. I hope everyone is resting well. Uh, I want to begin just by going over a couple of announcements. And I see uh, Sister Nakia Morris, Nakia Morris, exotic. Good to have you with us. And I see her sister, the good sister, Shauna C. Amen. <laughs> sister Burnett, you and Brother Burnett, God bless you uh, to both of you all as well. But I have something I want to go over with us uh, as we get started. It's going to take us just a bit past 6.30. Actually, you know what? I think I'm going to wait until 6.30 to begin. Let's just greet each other just for a few minutes. I've got my coffee here in front of me. It's been a good day. Got kind of warm outside. And I wonder if you can tell how the season is changing slowly into fall now. It gets darker a little bit later. It's getting a little bit warmer. It's getting, uh, the sun is coming up a little bit earlier. Uh, as a matter of fact, good evening to you, Sister Walla. Uh, as a matter of fact, I believe that daylight saving time should be coming up. And I may do a quick search here. If somebody has it, you can beat me to it. But when is daylight saving time? Is it in April this year or is it April, March? I know it's this month or next month. Uh, I'm going to do a quick search here. See if y'all can beat me. Daylight Savings, 2021. March the 14th. Oh, my goodness. So, I guess that would be the second... Sister Gardner, you beat me to it. Second Sunday in March. Time is going back. Mm, we certainly want to be ready for that. Now, let me say to you, as it normally does, that losing an hour of sleep... That's the most difficult for me personally. I don't know everyone else, but it's just, I think it's more mental than anything. But I still want you to take that extra time, go to bed early so you're not missing out on our Sunday school lesson or you're not missing out on our morning worship, Lord willing, on March the 14th. So I have a couple of announcements I want to go over, but we're going to do that after we have prayer it is about 6.30 now, so the only way to teach people to be on time is to begin on time. So if you have a moment, if you can pause what you're doing, assuming that you're not driving or something like that, 
Let's pause for a moment and let's have a word of prayer before we go into the study of God's word for tonight. So if you don't mind, pray with me. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we thank you and we praise you and we honor you. Father, you've been good to us. You've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. You've blessed us with so many tangible things, a place to stay, Father, food and clothing. Father, you've been so good to us. You've blessed us with jobs and careers to meet financial obligations. And even when times do become difficult, as they often do when we live in a fallen world, you've always been right there to lift us out of it. Trouble doesn't last always. And even now, Father, we thank you for the unspeakable gift of salvation. Thank you for giving your son to die for our sins, to shed his blood, to atone us. Father, to purchase us with his own sinless blood. We're not worthy of all that you've done, but we're still thankful for all that you do. We ask you, Lord, to bless us tonight, to give us understanding, to open your word up to us and open us up to your word. Help us, Father, to find truth in scripture and to forsake anything in that pursuit, to be obedient to what your word says, as James told us in his epistle, not to be hearers only, but to be doers of your word. So, Father, we thank you for the ones who are with us tonight, for the ones who are steadily joining, for the ones who may come a bit later. We thank you for every opportunity we have to share your word with your people. And we pray, Lord, that somebody, somewhere, Father, even if it's not immediately right now, maybe eventually down through the road can come across this, this teaching and hopefully it can be a blessing and a benefit to them. And we ask you this in the name of Jesus. They all said amen and amen. I thank the Lord for you, for all of you. And wanted to, you know, kind of collect my thoughts on a couple of things. And, and one of them is to remember our own choir president, uh, Sister Waller, in our prayers. Uh, I'm sure she's still going back and forth with family situations with the loss of her sister, and so I want to ask you, even though we are past the actual date of the celebration, the funeral services, still remember to pray for the Waller family, for all of those. And you don't have to know them all by name. God does. God knows every pain, every hurt, and he's aware of every tear. So Sister Waller, we love you. We, we thank the Lord for you. And we're going to keep you in our prayers as well. And uh, also on a, another note, I spoke with Deacon and Marcus Davis and in speaking with him, they have had a death in their family. So to Deacon Davis and his family, we want to ask you to please keep them in your prayers as well or put them in your prayers. And I have often said this before at the risk of repeating myself. I'll say it again. Everybody's going through something. Everybody's going through something. So suffering, when it comes to suffering, no man is an island. And I'm sure there are others of you that may be going through things and people may not be aware. Let me encourage you by knowing, uh, by letting you to know what to bring to your remembrance that God knows, God is aware, and God cares. Put everything in his hands. It may seem futile. It may seem like it's vain or empty. No, no, no. Prayer pays off good dividends. Deacon Gardner would always say that. The time you spend in prayer pays off good dividend. Thank you, too, Sister Waller. We appreciate you. And that brings me to another sad note. One of our own, and I say he's our own, Reverend Glenn Clark. Many of you may remember him. He and his wife, Clara, uh, they joined New Hebron. They united with us maybe 2013. He was called to preach uh, there at New Hebron. He preached his first sermon at New Hebron, and his family all came to support him. Well, I found out Sunday, over this past weekend, Reverend Clark has passed. I don't know the specific reasons, uh, medical complications. I don't know. But it was shocking. And from what I understand from his wife, uh, it was pretty sudden and abrupt. And so that's a wife now that's left to walk alone without her husband of so many years. So some of you may remember them. Some of you may not know them. They were with us for a few years, and I believe he 
retired and maybe took a position somewhere and retired again. But the services are going to be held this Saturday in Batesville, Arkansas at Friendship Baptist Church. Uh, she's asked me to come just for prayer, to be on services on the program. And I told her, uh, it's my pleasure. But if I wasn't on the program, I was going to come anyway. Uh, those of you who knew him and knew his wife, just kind, good-hearted people that love the Lord. And so to the Clark family, to their children, their grandchildren, all of their immediate family, extended family, we ask you to please keep them in our prayers and in your prayers, if you could do that for us. As I said, it's their time this time. Could be our time next time. And I also want to uh, remind everyone about our sermon series, uh, The Dysfunctional Family. Um, it's, it's amazing how God kind of puts things on your mind. I've never heard an audible voice. If it did, it would probably scare me <laughs> to death. But sometimes just a thought will randomly come to your mind, an idea out of nowhere. And you've been praying and thinking and praying and thinking. And God just put this on my heart. This Sunday, we're going to talk about reconciliation in the family. How can we get it fixed? And you know, sometimes one way to reconcile with a strained relationship in a family is just to admit when you've done wrong and say you're sorry. People sometimes are so full of pride, they know they have done wrong. They know they have caused a problem. But because they are so prideful, they won't even just say they're sorry. Now, we, we'll go into all of that. We are obligated to forgive everything, every time. Because if you wait from an I, for an I'm sorry, from family, friend, or foe, sometimes you won't get it. But just don't be the one who knows they've made a mistake and doesn't do what you know you should do just to admit I did wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. So we're going to look at reconciliation in the family, uh, Lord willing, on this Sunday morning. Now, we're going to get to our question. Uh, I have a two-piece, but I'll only be able to get one of them tonight. I've got other questions also, but because of what we're doing now, it's going to cut into some of the time. And ironically, New Hebrew, I want to say this to you. Uh, this is something that has been on my heart this week, which is we have to get prepared. Uh, I don't know when this pandemic will fade away, when it will phase out. I know doctors are doing things with vaccines, but it's still in God's hands. I will tell you this. When God opens that door of opportunity and the risk is minimal to none or it's all gone, when God does that, we're going to have to struggle. Some of us are going to have to struggle, struggle with something, laziness, being so comfortable. The way things are now, Bible study is not the full one hour. It might be 40 minutes, 35 minutes, 45 minutes. Sunday morning. You don't have to get up at 7, 7.30 and cook for your kids and get your dress out or get your suit out or get your hair done or shave and then leave at 8.45 or leave at 9 o'clock to come to Sunday school and then church at 10.45 and we're there till 12, 12.15, 12.30. No, those, you haven't done that in, in a year. Uh, you can wake up at 9.15, wipe your eyes, drink some water, have a cup of coffee and just hit the power button on your phone and instantly you're involved in our teaching and our preaching. You're involved in Sunday school and morning worship. It's going to be a hard pull for some to break that cycle of comfortability and get back to doing what we were previously doing all of our lives. And so I, I'm not giving some timetable of when I believe we can go back to church. I don't know. I want to be wise and I want to be safe. I'm not thinking of myself. We've got seniors. We've got children. And if one person gets sick, it would definitely put a damper on a whole lot of what we're trying to accomplish. So I want to be wise. This falls under the mindset of how Noah obeyed the Lord. He didn't build the ark when it was raining. He built the ark on dry ground. So be praying now. Stay focused Stay disciplined 
so that when God opens the door of opportunity, we don't slowly drag ourselves in there. No, no, no. We want to have that spirit David had when he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You know, so keep that on your heart. Keep that on your mind. And for all of the ones who are just working so hard, I know I will not get everyone's names right, but to our, our deacon ministry, I know Deacon Marcus Davis going down to the church and handling affairs, Deacon Brian Davis doing the same thing, going down to the church, Deacon Clint Smith, you know, the things that he's involved in. I know Deacon Gardner is uh, having health issues. His wife is home with him. I believe Deacon Credit may be a, a bit under the weather as well. I spoke to him not recently, but the last time I did, he was kind of under the weather. To our secretary, Sister Cheryl Brown and Sister Jackie Banks, I appreciate what you guys are doing. Brother Tim's taking care of the Sunday school book. Sister Tim's having to get a text from me and an email from me and a phone call from me asking about this. I forgot that and always so helpful, always so kind. And to the many others, if I didn't call your name and you're doing something, please, please know it's only an omission by mistake. I know there are so many other people involved, but I just want to say thank you. You know, job well done. God has been blessing our church. He's been blessing our service and our ministry. God has been good to us. He's really been favorable to us. There are so many churches, and I don't know everyone's internal affairs, but there are some pastors who kind of at least intimate to me that it's really difficult. It's really hard times. And God has blessed us to where we have not had to go through that valley. And we pray that we don't have to. But continue, New Hebron, to keep doing what you're doing. Not only can I see it, these human eyes can only see so far. But there is somebody that can see all things. And God, I am sure, at all of our hard work and discipline, is saying job well done. The issue is not to get men to appraise you and to say thank you. The issue is to have God say amen to what we're doing. So keep up the good work. I, I know I may have gone a bit long. I wanted to get all of this out, the prayers, the thank yous, the hard work. Don't forget, we're going to have to break this rusty boat sooner or later. So when it comes time for God to open those doors and we can get back into a Sunday school, get back into the choir stand, get back to choir rehearsal, get back to Bible study, get back to these things. Please, ma'am, please, sir, be ready. You know, keep yourself disciplined. Keep sharpening your sword with prayer and with studying the Bible. Amen and amen. And that was a lot, but I wanted to get that out. I felt it necessary. So because of that, I won't do the two-piece or three-piece question. We're only going to do one. As I say again, the only thing worse than coming to a teaching or a preaching or a study and not having your Bible is listening to teaching or preaching that doesn't require you to have a Bible. So you're going to need your Bible tonight. And the question is about anointing with oil. And that question is, okay, we see it in the Bible. I've seen it in Old Testament, New Testament. Are we to still do that today? Is that a mandate that we must follow today? And there are several passages we could turn to, but one that I believe hits it the best, at least in my opinion, makes it the most plain to us, even though it's kind of a layered and nuanced subject. Turn in your Bibles to James chapter five, and we're going to read verses, uh, uh -oh, not one, James chapter five, we're going to read verses 13 to 15. James chapter 5, we're going to read verses 13, 14, and 15. Now, we could do 12, but I want to start at 13, 14, and 15. And you all know the best way to understand scripture, to interpret scripture, three words, context, context, context. So you must know the scripture in context for you to make a proper interpretation. Once it's interpreted properly, then you can make a proper application. So James is writing to Christians that are scattered abroad. When Stephen was stoned and they killed him and Stephen died, he looked up to heaven 
he saw the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of the father. And all the men that stoned him dropped their coats at the feet of a man named Saul. And that Saul later was changed on the Damascus road to Paul. But Saul at that time, when he saw Stephen killed, he approved of it. And when Christians were killed, the Bible says there was a great persecution amongst the saints to where the, the Christians, the ones that followed Christ, they scattered. They had to hide. They had to flee. They found asylum in Gentile nations. And it is to those people who James is writing to. That makes a bit more sense when James says in chapter one, you know, uh, when he talks about uh, temp, uh, temptation and make sure I pull it up here. It kind of puts it in better context when James said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Because James is writing to people who are going through a tough time. And he, in essence, is trying to encourage them about having some hard times faith. So in chapter five, he's talking about the rich, uh, how rich men oppress you and things of that nature. And, and that's the mindset that the Jews are in who are reading this letter that was penned by James. They're being hunted. It's open season on Christian. And he's talking about suffering and maturing and how when you suffer, it makes you mature. Even in James chapter three, it talks about the tongue, you know, a mark of maturity it's not speaking with other languages or tongues, but can you control the one tongue you do have? <laughs> James said, from the same fountain, your mouth, comes sweet water and bitter. He said, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. You got to grow from that. You have to grow from talking about folks. You have to grow from laughing at folks. You have to grow from discouraging people. You must tame your tongue as a sign of your growth, of your maturing. And so in this particular section, suffering and sickness, when rightly understood and endured, can grow you. Suffering as a sign of another hardship that you go through, it can grow you. And even before we get to these three verses, we learn more about the goodness of God and the power of God in our difficult times, much more than we learn in our easy times. We learn more about how to lean and depend on God in the valley than we do on the mountaintop. So in James chapter five, verse 13, is any among you afflicted? Reading from the King James Version. Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms or songs. He said, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. There it is. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Just a quick note, when you look at James chapter five and verse 15, our key verse is verse 14. But when you look at verse 15, it talks about the, the prayer of faith, saving the sick, the Lord shall raise him up. But in that last section of verse 15, if he's committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, this is the Bible. This is James. This is the Lord making a link between sins and sickness. There is a link, a bridge. There is a union between sin and physical infirmity. In 1 Corinthians 11, when, when, when Paul is trying to uh, um, help the Corinthian believers about properly observing communion, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Well, as we get to the end of that section, when he talks about people observing the cup 
of the Lord unworthily, being guilty of the body and blood of the Lord? In 1 Corinthians 11 and 30, he said, for this cause, because you're not trying to actively get out of sin, because you're trying to show and perpetrate that you're in fellowship with God, but you're not in fellowship with man, because you're observing it unworthily. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many are asleep. Even in that verse, we can see another connection between physical sickness and in the case of the communion, death and sin. Let me please throw a huge red alert. If I had graphics, I would make that big square with the X like on Family Feud and say, stop, I'd make that buzzing noise. Because please, ma'am, please, sir, just because there is a link between sin and some sickness, you cannot assume when that's taking place in anybody's situation. So before you leave this forum and hear what I said and misunderstand that concept and start seeing somebody who's sick or seeing somebody who's suffering and say they must have done something wrong. That's why they caught pneumonia. That's why they got arthritis. That's why they got COVID. They've been doing something wrong. Can that happen? Yes, it can happen. Do you know when it's happening? No, you don't know. You might know for yourself. You and God can have a conversation, but don't assume to think someone is suffering because of sin because you just don't know that to be true. John chapter nine teaches us, us that. There was a boy that was born blind. The disciples said, somebody sin. who? His mother or his father. Which one of them sinned, Jesus, that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither one of them have sinned. He was born blind for this purpose right now for the glory of God. So is there a link between sin and sickness? It shows us that at the end of verse 15, if you've committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. We can look at 1 Corinthians 11 and 30 for this cause, observing the Lord's command unworthily. Many are weak and many are sickly. But there's still a John 9. You better drop in that big pot of gumbo. You don't know. Don't assume to know just because someone is sick or suffering, or going through a hard time, it is not your place to assume to know that that person may be suffering for something they've done wrong. Same thing they said to Job, but Job had done nothing wrong in order for God to allow those things to happen. So I wanted to give that disclaimer. But here in James 5, and if I make a mistake and say John I know that we are in James chapter five, verses 13 to 15. Please forgive me if I make a mistake and get James and John mixed up. But here in James chapter five, it talks specifically about oil. And when it's talking about oil, it's talking about olive oil. And it says, if somebody is sick, call for the elders, pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. The word anointing, don't let that word take on a hyper strong, super Christian meaning. It just means to rub, to smear. It, it, you can say I anointed my car with wax. <laughs> I just rubbed the wax on. It's just the language of the day. When we hear the word anointing, we think, oh man, he anointed, she anointed. Every Christian is anointed. That's a whole nother study. Anointing is not some special blessing God put on you. Every Christian is anointed by God. Point being, in this case, when you read the word anointed, it just means to rub or to smear. In this case, he talks about sickness, calling for the elders, praying over him, put oil on him. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. If he's committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, people, I'm going to tell you right now, this is a passage, whether we know it or not, that is very difficult to be dogmatic about. 
Very difficult to be dogmatic about. Difficult to say you have to do it or you don't have to do it because there are so many other times where oil had nothing to do with a person's healing or recovery from sickness. So let's go through it. There are two major groups on the interpretation of this passage and the, to answer the question about oil. One group is just, hey, it was a practical remedy. It was uh, something that Christ you or, or that the elders here used in the New Testament. It was just used for practical reasons. The second group, the second main understanding is it is symbolic for consecration or to set someone apart for the special care and use of the Lord, special care and blessing of the Lord. The first group, when it says oil has medical remedies to it, oil is used as a medical remedy, a practical remedy. In the Bible culture, in the times they were living, they would use olive oil to sometime for practical things. I found even in some of the Jewish uh, uh, historical writings and cultural, cultural writings, some people use oil for a toothache. And we even have in our minds kind of a template to understand that. You know how grandma, she knew how to go get this and get that and put some hot water and mix it up and here, drink this. And listen, we didn't, didn't have Excedrin PM and Tylenol with codeine in it. Mm -mm, no, no, you get that, you get this. They made stuff, practical things around the house to break a fever or to help with ear infection or to keep you from catching a cold. People would use olive oil in ways like that. In Luke chapter 10, I got my scriptures here, verses 25 to 37, there's an example of that, of the parable of the Good Samaritan, the lawyer, you know, who's my neighbor? Jesus said, well, let me give you a parable to let you know who your neighbor is. He talks about this Samaritan going down the road. He got beat up, he got passed up. But it's, or a Jew went down the road. And it says, this certain Samaritan, he came and looked on him. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 34, it says, he poured oil and wine in his wounds. Well, what's the purpose? Wine would be like alcohol to clean the wound. You probably have seen in some of the old Western movies. And, and Lord, I know I, this is just an example. They, they, they pull the arrow out and they get some alcohol, like liquor alcohol, and pour alcohol in there. He's, ah, ah. What? That is to, it's like rubbing alcohol in a sense. It's to clean out any dirt, debris, or prevent infection. So this Jew that was helped by a Samaritan, he poured in oil and wine. Wine to act like alcohol to clean the wounds or to cover it almost like some, uh, I'm trying to think of some uh, cortisone type stuff. He put olive oil on it to help start the healing process. So oil can be and was used in the Bible times as a practical remedy. However, oil was also used to pour on individuals to set them apart for the special care and use by God. In Exodus chapter 38, I believe it is, chapter 28, in verse 41, uh, Moses was receiving instructions. Get Aaron, get his sons, put these certain clothes on them and put these clothes on them and anoint them with oil. Now they weren't sick. They weren't coughing. No, it was poured on them to set them apart for the special care and use and service for the Lord. Jacob and Esau, when Jacob cheated Esau out of the birthright with the help of his mother, Esau was going to kill him. Rachel said, leave here. Your brother, you, you know your brother ain't about them games. He left that night, the first night he was away, on the run from his own brother. He went to sleep. He used rocks as a pillow. And in Genesis chapter 38, he had a dream about angels ascending and descending up a ladder. 
We've come to call that Jacob's ladder. God spoke to him. When he woke up that morning, he took oil and he anointed the stones. He poured it on the stones. He was like, surely God was in this place. That place later on became a place of worship. But he wasn't trying to heal anyone. He was just saying something special took place here. I want to pour oil on these stones to commemorate the event, to remember what God did, to remember what God can do and will do. So with all of that, how do we answer the question? And I'm so sorry to fall in this area. I cannot be dogmatic and say it has to be this way or it has to be that way. I will say this. Practically, as we look through the scripture, there were people who were healed and there was no oil involved. Even in today's time, how many of you have had a sickness of some sort, a suffering of some sort, and you didn't rub your body down with oil or anything? Listen, you prayed and God brought you through. So I couldn't go so far to say that it is necessary. You have to have it. That, and if you don't do it, then you're not following the program. You're not lining up with the Bible. I can't say that. I can't say that. But what if somebody uses it? You don't have to use it. But we do have a clear example here where someone has used it. It wasn't used every time. Now, Jesus, we know nothing in scripture where Jesus ever used any oil. We know plenty of time where prayers were being made and there was no oil involved. In our personal lives, we've seen people have a breakthrough, be delivered from some uh, sickness. If God didn't miraculously heal it, God sped up the recovery process. Should have took them six weeks. They were back on their feet in two weeks. We've seen these things happen to where oil was not used. If it is used, I wouldn't say it's a sin. But I still cannot say if you if you try to make somebody use it and, and tell them dogmatically, oh, you ain't doing it right if you don't use the oil. Well, no, you can't, you can't say that either. And so th this is a very perfect example to where some things in scripture are just not as crystal clear as we would want them to be. And you can say, well, God, why couldn't you make it clear? Well, well, because he's God and he's God all by himself. And when we get to heaven, we'll have a chance to ask him, you know, about that oil, James chapter five, man, what's up with it? We'll have plenty of times in that sweet by and by to get all these answers, but this is an issue to where God sovereignly chose not to make it as crystal clear as let's say John chapter three, verse 16. It's crystal clear. This is something that I cannot fall dogmatically on. And so I'm sorry, I, I, I hope that's not disappointing, but I don't wanna speak where God is silent. I know that. I do not wanna get ahead of God. I definitely know that. And so that's the information I was able to gather for that. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, I'm not trying to play politician. I'm just trying to be true to the text and not dishonor God by adding something that just ain't there. You know, so if somebody, me personally, whipped out some oil, I mean, where are you going to put it? Like my hand, my head? If it's a woman, what if she got makeup on? You finna mess up her makeup, man. You finna have a problem. You finna mess up her clothes. <laughs> I mean, can, can we do we do it like hand cleaner? Is it cheeks? It, it doesn't say. I would prefer not to. I'm like, well, you know, I'm I'm fine. Thank you. But I've had success praying and asking God for assistance, and I've never used oil. And I'm a Christian. I have experienced answered prayer, and there's been no oil. But there are some who I believe if you try to make it dogmatic and you try to make people say, if you're not using oil, then your prayer is not right and you're contradicting scripture. If you have a stance like that, I can safely say that's not that's not true. That you, you can't be dogmatic like that. The text isn't like that, you know. Because and then when you look at verse 15, 
anoint them with oil, call for the elders. Then you get to verse 15. It said, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. If he's committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. It says nothing about the oil. Well, what saved the sick? It said the oil. No, it said the prayer of faith and the Lord. So, so, so you see why when putting scripture in context, you cannot be dogmatic on this particular subject. But I can say in verse 15, James makes no claim for the oil. It would have been a perfect place to place it in verse 15. What's going to save the sick? The prayer of faith. Who's going to raise him up? The oil. No, the Lord. And if he's committed any sins, guess what? The sins shall be forgiven him. So Sister Timms and Sister Verdi Davis and Brother uh, Tidwell, looking at some other some of the other names, to the you know, to the good sister, to the bad sister, to my aunt Rosetta, to my cousin Tanya, you know, to, to everyone, we cannot be dogmatic on a situation or a subject like this. I just want to give you the best that I know and try to stay true to scripture. Amen. This one was a bit more difficult <laughs> than, than maybe some others. So hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully that was beneficial. I'll reiterate a couple of things again. Uh, our prayer for our own, for the Davis family, prayer for Sister Waller. Please keep her in prayer. Many of you uh, may or may not know Reverend Glenn Clark. He and his wife, Clara, uh, well, Reverend Clark has gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, this past weekend, he died uh, suddenly. And uh, the services will be held at Friendship Baptist Church in Batesville this Saturday at 11 a.m. So I plan on going you know, y'all please pray for me on the road from these unattentive drivers and sleepy drivers and help me to pay attention and be awake as well. You know, so I'll be going up there to check on the family and hopefully, you know, give them some comfort the best way that I know how and come along back home. And don't forget, keep your sword sharp. Don't let apathy, don't let callousness or carelessness, don't let laziness set in when the Lord opens the door of opportunity. And we don't know when, and I'm not predicting when. When God opens that door, let's hurriedly get back to serving and praising and showing our devotion and love. And thank you to everyone who's working in the forefront and in the background. And Lord willing, this Sunday morning at 1045, hope you all have your new Sunday school books too. But after Sunday school, Lord willing, at 1045, we're going to look at the dysfunctional family. But in this case, we're going to look at reconciliation in the family. Sometimes peace can occur if you just admit you was wrong and apologize. But pride sometimes can get us so wrapped up, you can know you've done wrong and still never give a person the satisfaction of saying, I'm sorry. And that can prolong the strain in a relationship in many cases, especially in the family. So God bless you. And I thank you. I appreciate you. Uh, until we meet again. I pray that everyone stays safe and enjoy the rest of your night. Amen and amen.